Welcome everyone to our uh, panel on African Voices on the Green Impact Fund for Technology. Our panel title is Critical Questions for a Green Impact Fund for Technology. And I look forward to hearing about some of those critical questions and asking them with all of you. Um, we have three panelists today. I will introduce them before they speak and they will all speak uh, one in turn and we will hold questions for the end. My name is Brian Galligan. I am a Jesuit with Jesuit Justice and Ecology Network Africa here in Nairobi. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Um, so our first panelist today will be Dr. Emmanuel Nyadzi. So uh, Dr. Nyadzi, if you would like to begin your screen sharing process now, you may. Dr. Emmanuel Nyadzi is a researcher at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. He has expertise in climatology and uses mixed methods to understand, anticipate, and manage the complexities of climate change and their impacts on natural and human systems. A central part of his work is to offer insight into the present and future impact of climate change in Africa and explore opportunities for the holistic development of the continent. Dr. Nayazi, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Brian, for, and also thank you very much, everyone, and uh, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to wherever you are. And uh, I'm so grateful that uh, the Global Justice Partner and also Gina, the Jesuit Network uh, for Justice and Ecology, have invited me to express my opinions regarding um, Green um, Fund for Technology. So I'll spend the next few uh, minutes to talk about the crossroads between climate change and the green growth in Africa and a bit of elaboration on the fund also. Uh, I'm sure the narrative on the climate change is actually established and it's no longer whether it's going to change or not, but whether how we are going to survive the change and also what will we do to reduce the emissions level as far as uh, climate change is concerned. And um, currently the, the, the world is, uh, is now about 1.2 degree warmer than the 19th century. And the uh, carbon dioxide also in the atmosphere has risen to about 50%. And we all singing the same song of making sure we keep global warming to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. Uh, but however, if we refuse to achieve this and the uh, global warming increases beyond the 1.5, there will be a dramatic change in the uh, various climatic variables, such as um, the at uh, two degrees Celsius, we can all see that temperature across the African continent is going to be uniformly increased. And also precipitation is going to be increased as well. However, there are also going to be some element of deficit that will cause water scarcity. But in Central Africa is going to be huge, which will correspond with the hydrological systems, especially with the Congo Basin and where water levels, for example, last year, 2020, was expected to have increased, which resulted in, in flood. And if you continue to wait a bit longer and we get to four degrees, the temperature will become more west. And then also the precipitation and deficit of rainfall, I mean, flood, drought will also become very severe. So this is a narrative that is happening. Uh, with the changing climate, as we all experience now, about 53 African countries already reported high level of impacts. Flood drought always topping the, the list. And then we also have some impacts in terms of wildfire, landslides, and also dust. And not only that, temperature increase and sea level rise, and also precipitation patterns are continuously changing. Now this is manifested um, in several economic losses. The data gathered from 1970 to 2019, you observe that about 38 billion economic losses of these uh, affected the continent. And not only that, about 1,695 of these disasters are actually happening. And almost about 731,000 and over people actually died from this situation. The interesting phenomenon is that uh, flood might be increasing a lot of the disasters, but when it comes to the death of people which is resulting more in droughts. So this is the narrative of climate impact. And the recent ones and unprecedented situations is the, is the cyclone, for example, a dive which happened in South Africa, southern part of Africa, um, interlinking Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Malawi. 
and some other countries also within the same territory suffering from floods, southern and eastern Africa. Um, cyclones and storms, even just the year 19, 2019 to 2020, within a year, we've had almost about six um, cyclones and also about four, which has risen to that level. And this is continue, we are predicted to continue to increase. Not only that, the drought situation in South Africa is also unprecedented, and then especially the North and the East Cape provinces are also highly impacted. Let's not forget our landslides, which is happening in Congo, central part of Congo, killing many in the Cote d'Ivoire as well. The East, for flood is happening across the continent, but especially the East, Central, North, and then West Africa. 285 people were suspected, I mean, died actually in Kenya in the year 2020. And 155 also died in Sudan, with almost 800,000 people being affected. So the change that is happening in the climate is really having a dying impact on the life of many people. Now that we know the situation of how the climate change is happening and what is going to happen, if we all refuse not to keep it at uh, 1.5 degrees warm, what will happen? Let's look at the economic situation in Africa. Then after that, I'll look at the crossroads between these two. So the narrative of Africa has actually, the economic situation of Africa have changed over the years. This was a report from the economics in the year 2000, Africa being tagged as a hopeless continent. But going forward in the year 2013, you can see a very beautiful music being sung again as a hopeful continent. Now, so many people will not um, agree with the view that Africa as a continent is actually increasing and in, uh, it's actually performing better these days. It's actually been recognized as one of the uh, the fastest growing continent in the globe. However, a lot of things are there for us to celebrate. There's increase in income, reduction in poverty. I mean, household consumption has doubled. Not only that, maternity situation has increased. I mean, people are assessing and connecting. So there are a lot of progress that we can all measure. However, in the last few periods, uh, decades, I would say. However, the challenges remain. The population of Africa is expected to increase. And this is supposed to and by the year 2050, it's supposed to be bigger than the world most populated countries, China, and then followed by India. Nigeria is expected to be bigger than the US. And if you look at all these stories, what is happening is that we need more jobs to be able to meet the demands of these countries in the continent of Africa. What we need is employment creation is becoming a problem. Agriculture is being constrained by the climate change. Industrialization is very slow. So this is the situation of the continent now. In order for us to rectify these problems, Africa needs to create more jobs and create more, grow also the economy. Now, however, the problem with Africa now is that it's in a situation where you want more out of the environment where that is very limited and it has limits on how much you can give. And the technology that we actually adopting and employing, most of them are contributing significantly to CO2 emissions. Our growth strategies are also not inclusive. So what do we do now? Should we continue to produce now and then actually clean later? That is a concern that many are saying. Or we should try to produce and improve the economy whilst also improving the resilience of the ecosystem. The China case, for example, China, we all know grew up 10% group a year for almost over 30 or three decades. And what happened is that currently degradation is actually affecting the economy's uh, GDP almost about 9%. So if we choose to in improve or grow now and then clean later, we are likely to face the challenges. Now, the idea now is that we need to go inclusive or grow green. And talking about green growth, we're talking about economic and social and environmental sustainability. So now let's delve on a bit about the green growth idea that Africa is seeking to embark on in the globe, also calling upon across the world. Now the terminology actually began in the blueprint for green economy some years uh, in 1989 and also gained much attention in 2008 because of the global recession. And more particularly in 2012, the issue of the green growth became an, a household discussion, especially during the sustainable development agenda. It is an interlink between ecosystem economy and human well-being, but more particularly, it is focused on economy where and resources are used efficiently and also the ecological systems are more resilient and a bit of the human well-being or the inclusiveness of society. The reason why we need to include society 
is that of course there can be no economic growth and ecosystem that will benefit only a few people. So green growth in Africa is seen to be the way forward. But we must also know that green technologies and innovations are an integral part of this green economy or this green growth. And these green technologies seek to protect the environment, reduce pollution, and also ensure that resources are used more efficiently. When we're talking about these green technologies, we should look at it in not an individual technology, but we should look at it in a very holistic form where a total system is under consideration. And this encompasses uh, the product itself, the services it renders, and also the procedure in producing um, this uh, product or technology. It is important that Africa this, uh, begins to explore existing and local technologies and innovations at its uh, doorstep. And where it is not available, we try to also do some technological transfer. And in trying to do technological transfer, the issue of local capacity comes in, and more importantly, intellectual property rights. So proper, uh, most technologies are, are, are supported by a property rights that do not allow it to be used on the continent, really. And at the same time, some local technologies also don't have property, uh, intellectual property rights that is protecting them. So we must look at it. Whilst others are being protected, then also it must be create, it must be flexibility for others to also use the existing technology despite the property rights that they have. And I think this is what gives our global fund, a green fund for technology is going to do a bit more. I'll throw more light on that. But then these technologies must also be compatible with the socioeconomic issues on the country whilst we are doing the transfer and also the development goals of the country. Green technologies are indeed very um, uh, are great ideas, and um, it is important that we recognize that they'll be more valuable, especially for um, resource demanding sectors like energy manufacturing, where we stop using coal and then use maybe um, electrical cars for transport section. We start using solar panels also for buildings, uh, recycling um, waste water and also waste uh, materials. So now the problem now is that. Africa is facing climate change problems. The economy of Africa is also having its own problems, but yet we need to go the direction of green growth. Green technologies are an important element of this green growth. However, they are very expensive. We all know that to go green has its own long-term benefit, but Africa is already struggling with a lot of economic issues that is raising their cost. For example, mix it at 2010 says that if you want to invest in green growth, uh, if you want to invest in energy efficiency, energy efficiency globally, sorry, about 90 billion can be injected. We are likely to save almost about 600 billion. But Africa do not have even as much as to be able to invest into this green growth. So what happens in 2009? Already we know that uh, unless one country has promised to give us 100 billion, up every year before by 2020. But these targets have been missed. And OSF, for example, reported this um, result. And whilst it says that the targets have not been achieved, it mentioned that most of these, uh, it, um, is more, it's mentioned that there is also hope that this particular um, target can likely to be met. And this raised uh, tensions for the COP26 that recently happened in the Glasgow. So going forward, um, Osfarm also assess this fund and also realize that the problem that these figures that were reported by OSET was actually inflated. Now, his, his argument was that some of these loans were considered in, as some of our development aids were considered as a, a climate finance, which was not. So construction projects were reported in the OSET report as a, a green fund, a climate fund finance, but it's not supposed to be. And not only that, some of the loans that were given were also calculated in full. Meanwhile, they are supposed to look at those ones that were given at a below the lending rate. So, and even the report that OSED used was actually a report generated by these same and as one countries by their own statistics. So this argument that was raised by Osfarm has been supported by middle and low income countries, which most, most of them are from Africa. And the issue here is that even about a third about the climate finance that has been recorded, a third is actually a third lower than what is actually reported. And 20.5% is only what has gone to these countries. So what do we do now? We have to look at it very 
critically that this finance, as we are talking about the green fund, we should be looking at these challenges as you are facing already in climate finance. India, for example, disputed that the OECD report of 62 billion climate finance in 2014 is actually 1 billion. So these are some of the issues. Now, how do we promote green growth or promote these uh, green technologies? We need to mobilize uh, funding in a way that uh, this green impact fund for technology is key to achieving that. Mobilizing funding means that both public and private sector need to contribute. And also we need to have access to cheaper technology, political will and commitment and of leaders on the continent are essential because you need to create environments where entrepreneurs can bring out the ideas and innovations. And then there should be mechanism to actually provide subsidy reforms for individuals who want to bring out these technologies. And if we are able to create credible compliance systems where, for example, justice system that can enable people to receive justice when need be, I mean, some of these technology or entrepreneurs will be able to rush onto the country. We should be able to also value what we gain from the environment. And that will allow us to even value the technologies that will be actually invented. So when we are able to estimate ecosystem product and complement with GDP, it will bring a lot of awareness for people to do that. Now, mainstreaming green growth into national agenda is very key. We can't look at green growth as an isolated agenda, but we should mainstream it. And Rwanda and Ethiopia, for example, already started that. So promoting green growth in Africa. Now let me uh, analyze on the issue of green um, technology and the fund that we are talking about, the gift. It, the gift has a great potential, but let us be very cautious whilst we are implementing this. We should have an agreed methodology for measuring the contribution in terms of how much funds comes in and even how much emissions that these technologies are able to raise. Because one of the issues is that the fund is going to be disbursed based on your, um, your contribution to redu reducing emissions or based on the technology's contribution to reducing emissions. And these are some of the problems that already the climate finance is already facing. We don't have an agreeable method of measuring contributions and how it's being dispersed. Not only that, Emission reduction alone is not enough. We must also look at the innovation that are responsible. So still go, for example, argued for a responsible innovation framework. That says the renovation should be anticipatory, it should be reflexive, inclusive, and responsive. So in a way that if we look at these innovations, not only as um, not only the emission reduction capabilities of the innovation, but rather looking at it in a more responsible manner for them to also achieve other kind of side attraction or side benefits. For example, innovations that can contribute also to adaptation at the same time um, mitigate, uh, mitigation should be given some kind of uh, priority and in, in, the, in, the, in the disbursement of the, the gift. So most innovations are also um, at idea stages in Africa and these are done mostly by young people. Now the question is these young people who are not competitive enough, how can they compete with the uh, technological firms that are coming mostly from the West in terms of receiving these funds to be able to create and reduce greenhouse gases? Now, transparency, we should be able to track the systems that uh, the system, we should have a systematic tracking uh, mechanism and also reporting. Not only that, capacity to assess this fund and deploy the fund and also track, track it is very essential for the survival and the benefit of uh, the gift. So in my, my final remark is that climate change, you all know, is a primary crisis multiplier and indeed is a key driver for this green growth agenda. So no green economy without obviously no green technology. So the idea of the green um, the economy is laudable, but it's actually being constrained by political apathy and most importantly, finance. And green impact fund for technology is really timely and important to support this. However, we should also ensure that some of these considerations that I've mentioned earlier, especially emission reduction, not being the only source of uh, motivation for the Green Fund, but rather we look at the technologies that in a very holistic way, such that they are very responsible you know, um, innovations at the same time contributing to adaptation is essential in this regard. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope to join the discussions uh, going forward.
Great, Dr. Nyadzi, thank you so much for that contribution. Yeah. Um, you raised some questions there at the end about, uh, especially about implementation of a green impact fund for technology that mm -hmm. I would love to return to at the end of our panel. Um, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Ife Sinache Okafor Yarwood. Um, so Dr. Okafor Yarwood, if you would like to start your screen sharing, you may. Um, Dr. Okafor Yarwood is a lecturer at the University of St. Andrews School of Geography and Sustainable Development in Scotland and a visiting research fellow at the National Defense College's Institute of Strategic Research and Studies in Nigeria. Her work advances an interdisciplinary understanding of ocean sustainability and criminality as a question of resource management, environmental justice, and the disproportionate effects of depleting marine resources on inequality, poverty, and insecurity. Dr. Okafor Yarwood has extensive field research experience with strategic maritime stakeholders and communities in West and Central Africa. She regularly consults for regional and international organizations on issues of maritime governance, peace, and security. Her current research deepens understandings of maritime security and governance to consider the gendered dimensions of maritime insecurity across the Gulf of Guinea. Dr. Okafor Yarwood, welcome. It is so good to have you here. Professor, I think you are muted still. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I need to go back. Can so say there's something wrong. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay. I need to stop sharing and go back to sharing again. Okay. Oh, what I need. Sorry. I'll start again. Okay. Yeah. Can't see. Good afternoon. And I'm not sure what's happening. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's actually a privilege to be here to talk about the blue economy in a blue in a green economy. And today's presentation, I'll be focusing on the idea of a sustainable fisheries partnership agreement between the European Union and select countries in West Africa. And the essence of it, focusing my presentation on this, is to be able to show that whilst in the context of climate change at the global level, we speak as a global community in terms of how we understand the impact of climate change. But when it it gets to the point of trying to implement to mitigate the impact of climate change. We are quite individualistic or nationalistic to the point that so many nations, especially those that can, tend to export their unsustainable practices elsewhere to the detriment of the other countries or the other regions where they are exporting it to. And the first presentation by Dr. Emmanuel already introduced us to the idea of a green economy, which simply defined is centered around low carbon resource efficient and is socially inclusive. And of course, the idea of the blue economy mirrors green economy and was, you could say generally adopted or streamlined or brought to the mainstream in 2012 at the Rio 2012 conference. And it mirrors the blue, green economy in that it also seeks to prioritize economic growth, social well-being, and ecological conservation. So it's no longer about focusing so much on economic growth, but ensuring that the social wel welfare or well-being of the people are taken into account, and of course, environmental conservation. But the green economy and the blue economy is based on sharing, secularity, collaboration, solidarity, resilience, opportunity, and interdependence. And by this, the, 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 the aim of course is that if this is present, then it's, it's going to be practically impossible for the triangle not to be achieved. And this triangle again is economy, environment, and the social well-being. 
And so before I, I decided to prepare my presentation, I went through the Green Impact Fund to reach through it to see whether there was a way I can connect it, you know, from green and then talk us through the blue economy. And then two things stood out for me, especially in relation to the advantages of gifts that were listed. It noted that it's going to be centered on fairness, it's going to be centered on flexibility. And if you read the SAP, this is actually taken directly from GIFT's um, website. If you read the SAP, and then the example that I've given below, as you can see from the pictures on the right, you would note, note that, of course, disadvantages is very important. And in an ideal world, if, if it were to be achieved or, or, or sort of if we, if we were to attempt to pursue the idea of a green economy in this way, and of course also the, the blue economy in this way, then this would be an ideal way to do it in that we will ensure that economic growth is not prioritized to the expense of social well-being and ecological conservation. But in the current state, and this is why I talk about countries being individualistic, we find that in relation to technologies, for example, and efforts to mitigate the impact of climate change, that the countries that have the capacity, the countries that have the money, are actually extracting resources from so many vulnerable countries, one of which is DRC in relation to Colbert and the important role that Colbert is playing in technology and also electric cars. You see that re these resources is taken at an unsustainable level human rights being abused just in the name of being able to get hold of this call but then there are actually researchers and people that have argued that the extent or the, the, the revenue that is generated from Colbert in DRC is one of the reasons why the conflict is, is, is continued or is sort of difficult to solve the problem in that part of the world. And of course, this can be contested because you could talk about the historical conflict that's existed in that region before COVID extraction, but you can also not ignore that it could have a role in it. There's also the point of um, toxic waste dumping, but primarily focusing on e-waste dumping, whereby wealthy countries, especially West, Western countries like those in the, like the United States or United Kingdom tend to export their used electronics as e-waste, actually not e-waste, but reusable electronics, when in fact it is e-waste, but this is actually to be able to circumvent the Basel Convention on Transboundary Movement of, 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 of Electronics or Waste. And so this is again another example that shows that whilst we speak climate change in terms of the language at the global level, but when it comes to effort to try to mitigate the impact, it is almost always the case that countries tend to do things very in, in an individual manner, in an individual level, trying to do as much as they can to mitigate the impact on them without necessarily caring how their actions might affect the other people. And to show how this is um, manifesting itself in the blue economy, I'm going to be centering on fisheries resources. And of course, this is very important. Why am I focusing on fisheries? Because I could have easily focused on maritime transport and shipping or maritime tourism or offshore hydrocarbon. But I'm focusing on fisheries because of its significance in terms of the food security contribution it makes for not only Africans, but West African people, given that this is my focus. As a source of protein, it, it sometimes um, contributes up to 80% of the animal protein and sometimes is the only source of animal protein consumed by coastal communities. It provides employment for over 9 million people in West African region. And whilst men dominate fishing activities, women usually work in the fisheries value chain. And so you could see how the fish trade itself it's complementary in terms of the gender roles, how men are doing one thing and the women are complementing what the men are doing and supporting each other collectively, especially given that for so many communities, fishing is not about income or about just generating the food, but it's also about sustaining a tradition that has been passed down to them by, by their ancestors um, from generation. And as you can see from this pie chart, you can see the importance of the fisher in that fishing itself becomes a, a chain empowerment scheme whereby one person, the fisher, can empower 
up to 20 other people, either the fishmonger, the processor, the distributor, the unloader. And from this, so many families are empowered in that their food is provided, education, healthcare, and everything else. And so this also gives you an idea of the potential threat that these other people that rely on this fisher can face if fish depletes. The reality, however, is that as I'm speaking to you, fish stock is actually depleting at a very high level for different reasons. So for example, we have the threat of marine pollution. In the Niger Delta area, research has shown that since um, oil exploration started in 1958, the mangrove of Niger Delta, about 40% of mangrove have died due to oil. And of course, this is very problematic given that the mangrove of Niger Delta is also said to be a breeding ground for up to 60% of the fish stock that breed in the Gulf of Guinea region. So it means that anything that undermines the sustainability of fish stock in the Niger Delta area automatically undermines the sustainability of fish stock for the adjoining countries within the Gulf of Guinea. There's also the threat of illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, which researchers have noted that in West Africa alone, it amounts or it represents about 40 to 65% of the legally reported catch. Emmanuel hinted and talked a lot about the impact of climate change. Well, this is also a problem because according to the World Bank, unless fisheries governance is improved by 2050, the fisheries production in some of West African countries is going to be halved with Nigeria being reduced by 53%, 56% in Cote d'Ivoire and 60% in Ghana. Of course, this is problematic given that research have shown that currently about 50% of the fisheries between the waters between Nigeria and Senegal is already depleted. So it means that we're already working on half. And so imagine what would happen unless something radically different is done to change the situation. There's also the threat of, it, of legal fishing, which is not necessarily the focus a lot of the times because a lot of um, research scholars, uh, um, non-governmental organizations tend to focus on the threat of illegal fishing and rightly so because, well, if you can stop illegal fishing, you would have sort of succeeded in at least helping with the sustain um, sustainable use of the fisheries resources. But my discussion today is going to focus primarily on legal fishing. There's also the threat of the BE sector. Of course, the awareness of the potential, um, um, the potential that lie within the blue economy, the sector itself within the ocean, have attracted a lot of investors, people being sort of investors being interested in, in seabed mining, for example, offshore hydrocarbon exploration, as so many oil companies are actually now talking about divesting, moving from um, on land to offshore as a way of diversity. And you see uh, so many countries, at least on the African continent, investing through this um, China's Belt and Road Initiative, expanding their port infrastructure as a way of mitigating the impact of climate change and ensuring sustainable exploitation of the ocean resources. We're actually also seeing expansion on um, marine protected areas. All these things exacerbate the extent to which the fisher that I've talked about in the other slide is able to continue to exploit resources at a sustainable level and be able to provide for the family. Why? Because the impact is, of course, the traditional fishing ground reduces significantly by the threat um, to the ocean and also by the threat that is brought upon by the um, further development of the BE sector. But like I said, my presentation is going to be focusing on legal fishing and the role of the European Union. I'm focusing on them because they actually play a very important role and continue to play an important role in efforts to ensure sustainable um, exploitation of fisheries in, on the African continent and also improve fisheries governance. And by this, they provide funding to agencies or fisheries advisory bodies. And so it's very important to then see how, at least from my part, I see it as uh, being um, hypocritical, given that you recognize something is wrong and you're helping these countries to do better. But at the same time, you're part of the problem through the way that you're exploiting the resources in those waters and through your act or your actions and inactions. Before I start with the, my 
the presentation of sort of presenting the, um, the facts or the evidence to support this argument. Um, um, I, I'd like to share this with you. And this represents the, the statues of fish stock in select countries on the African continent. Um, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, you can see the list is endless. And the red depicts depleted or overexploited. And species that are at this level actually needs to be allowed to regenerate. And I want you to focus or sort of remember um, species like the common hack, the Senegalese hake, which is depicted as red. It means it is um, depleted, overexploited, and therefore needs to be allowed to regenerate. We can also see that uh, there is a tuna species there, a couple of tuna species like the Atlantic blue tuna and the um, um, southern bluefin tuna, tuna, again, it is depleted and therefore should be allowed to regenerate. But is this what is happening? Well, it is not. And the reason for this is the EU common fisheries policy. The EU common fisheries policy was introduced in 1983, later revised in 2013, and then implemented in 2014. The Common Fisheries Policy recognizes the United Nations Clause on the Law of the Sea, Convention of the Law of the Sea call for the sustainable exploitation or use of the ocean resources. And so the CFP is to allow EU countries to be able to ensure the sustainable exploitation of their resources. But at the same time, realizing that some species in the EU waters is already overexploited and needs to be regenerated, the CFP made way for fisheries partnership agreement. Initially, that, was, that is what it was called until the 2013 reform, where it now became sustainable fisheries partnership agreement. Well, I'm not really sure if, if it makes any difference to have the sustainable on it, because, well, maybe the sustainable aspect is beneficial to the EU or countries in the EU, but is definitely not sustainable for the third countries on the African continent with whom they have such agreements with. Because what happens then is that through the CFP, they're able to provide subsidies to their vessels and therefore at the same time able to export their over-exploitation or unsustainable practices to countries on the African continent, such as those in West African region. At the same time, I also want to note at this point, because you can see the figure on your right, and you might wonder why is this important. It is important because as part of the collective effort by the EU to ensure sustainable fisheries, in 2010, they introduced this regulation whereby um, the cutting system or the CAD certification system, whereby countries that are not doing enough to ensure sustainable fisheries might be given, for example, a yellow card as a warning, you need to do something radically different else you will not be able to export to the EU market or we would not be able to do business with you. Red means we are no longer doing business with you. Green means you've made the improvement that is needed and therefore you're welcome back. We can do business with you. And the paper that I wrote with my colleague, um, Dr. B Dihia Belhabib in 2020, we argued that actually this cadence system is also very political because if you look at this figure on your right and the countries that were given red card, our argument is actually that the countries that are giving yellow card are countries where the EU has more business relationship with and therefore cannot necessarily afford in terms of the economic aspect, afford to lose that business. But the ones that they actually give a red card to uh, in comparison to the ones that's been given yellow card are countries that the significance in terms of the economic value of the business relationship is inconsequential in comparison. So they can afford to say, well, this is your yellow card, um, sort yourself out or we're no longer doing business with you. And of course you can decide whether you agree with this analysis or not, but this was the finding what we found. And this is depicted with the yellow um, being a warning and the red being we're no longer doing business with you. And our argument is that actually, even on that side, that the cadence system in itself is very political and as they are very selective in who is giving the card or not. And so I've also included what this um, um, reformed CFP, this is the reform common fisheries policy, 
what it seeks to achieve. So you can understand why I'm making the argument around how other countries or powerful states are actually exporting their unsustainable practices elsewhere despite speaking the language of sustainability at the global level. So in the reform CFP, they talk about paying attention to environmental, economic, and social dimension of fisheries. Again, the blue economy or the green economy, what it should represent. Fish stock management at, at maximum sustainable yield by 2020 for all managed fish stock. Gradual introduction of landing obligation by 2019. Continued application of the so-called multi-annual plan MMP. MAP to manage fish stocks. And then I've already talked about the EU um, cutting system. What is very important about this and is also very important for us to understand is that the CFP actually, when it was renewed in 2013, extended the ambition or the objective beyond the EU to the third countries. So it means that the sustainable exploitation of fisheries resources as the goal of the CFP is not restricted to EU countries alone. This is also then extended to the third countries. So it means that even when the EU is operating in a Liberia, for example, the goal is also that they would not um, engage in, in practices that undermine the sustainability of fish stock in those countries. And I'm showing you here, list of countries in West Africa, Western Central Africa, where the EU currently have valid fisheries agreement. Of course, when the paper was published in 2020, some of the other countries that we had on the list are no longer there, like Liberia, because it has um, expired. The agreement they have with Liberia have expired now. But these are the countries where the EU have um, current fisheries agreement. And you can see that for the species that they have the agreement with, we have the tuna, 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 mist, tuna, tuna, and hake. Remember, I told you about the Senegalese hake, which is already red, over-exploited. Therefore, it shouldn't be exploited in the context of that vision of you know, targeting species and, and fishing within maximum sustainable yield, but it is on the list. The same thing with tuna. We talked about the Atlantic bluefin tuna and the Southern bluefin tuna being on red. It shouldn't be exploited because it needs time to regenerate. Well, it is on the on the list for exploitation as part of the Sustainable Fisheries Partnership Agreement. And so the problem with this, of course, and this is providing evidence in support of the analysis, is that if you then look at the countries we looked at on our paper, which was published in 2020, you will see that species like round sardinella, um, Atlantic horse mackerel, sapier cuttle fishes, jacks horse mackerel, yellowfin tuna, swordfish, skipjack tuna, and big eye tuna are overexploited. These are for the countries in red, and the percentage to which the species that are targeted by disagreement is overexploited. And so it tells you how actually, even though it is legal, the so-called sustainable fisheries partnership agreement between the EU and Western Central African countries is absolutely unsustainable and counterproductive to what the idea of the green blue economy should entail. Of course, it might work for the EU because it have allowed or it is allowing their resources time to regenerate. And hence this argument of exporting unsustainable practices elsewhere. That's why the fact that we speak with a global language when it comes to climate change and mitigating the impact of climate change, countries, powerful states, when I say powerful, those that can afford to, are very individualistic, nationalistic, and very selfish in the way they're implementing it. Because as you can see from the analysis, again, from our paper, we found that over 20% of the species caught in Sao Tome and Principe by the EU at the time are overexploited. 41% in Mauritania, 7% in Guinea-Bissau, 55% in the Gambia, and 28% in Cabo Verde. Again, these are countries that are very vulnerable, not only to climate change, but it also their economic ability to even negotiate. Because I'm sure some of you will be thinking, so why are you negotiating with them when you know that these species are threatened? Well, they're negotiating because they need the money. And if the EU comes and as a country, well, some of us are already familiar with this whole idea of tied aid or the way politics work. It might be that despite the recognition that we shouldn't be doing this, 
we are doing it because we have to, because we need the money. Because so many countries, obviously we've talked about, we've heard from Emmanuel about how costly mitigating the impact of climate change can be. Countries need the money to be able to mitigate the impact of climate change. And if this is one of the ways they can get that money, then so be it. Also continuing with the argument of legal but unsustainable, Dihia Bel Habib with her colleagues wrote in 2015 about Guinea-Bissau, whereby between 2000 and 2010, in terms of the agreement they had with the EU, <coughs> excuse me, was 5.7 million was paid for fisheries agreement. However, this allowed EU vessels to extract species worth 27.6 million. I'm highlighting this because it tells you how, even in terms of this agreement, the amount they pay pale into insignificance when you compare it with the amount they actually make from this agreement. I've also provided the example from China, even though I said this was going to be EU thing, but so that you also know the, the role that the Chinese are playing in um, exacerbating unsustainable practices on the African continent. The same Bel Habib 2015 noted that in the same period, the Chinese paid Guinea-Bissau government 2.9 million for fisheries agreement, and it allowed them to extract 34 million. This is legal. This is a legal agreement that have allowed them to happen. But at the same time, something is also happening because we're thinking, okay, so how can government do something radically different? In the case of Guinea-Bissau, the agreement they had with the EU expired in 2017, but they stalled the agreement. They stalled the renegotiation of the agreement when the EU wanted to do that. It was delayed for almost one year because Guinea-Bissau was arguing, they were actually literally asking for more money. They wanted more benefits. So one of this um, quote came from the EC website. The renegotiation was delayed due to disproportionate economic and technical conditions proposed by Guinea-Bissau authorities. But in the end, because it seems that the negotiation worked, because in the end, a year plus later, in 2019, an agreement was then reached whereby it was extended in exchange of um, access, five years access to 50 EU vessels. The EU pay um, financial contribution of 15.6 million per year, an increase from 9.2 million, you know, the previous year. And so this tells you also what can be achieved if countries are, are able to negotiate at a higher level or at least understand from what level they are negotiating from. And I've given this example of Guinea-Bissau because I feel that it's actually very powerful given that if you're already familiar, since 2014, Guinea-Bissau is literally destabilized in terms of the political situation, but yet they were able to negotiate at this level. So imagine what a country that is stable can do in terms of negotiation and asking for a better deal, because the reality is that they actually do not have the capacity to extract the resources themselves. And based on United Nations Conference on Law of the Sea, you have to then allow another country that can to do this. So what is the impact of all these things? We've talked about a lot. What is the impact of unsustainable practices? The impact is of course on, on human security, the security of the people. And so we start looking at things like how deprivation might put, put someone to engaging in illicit activities, why deprivation might put someone to, well, I'm no longer catching enough fish, I'm going to convert my boat and traffic people or transport people from Senegal, for example, to a place where we can maybe get a better life in the, in the Mediterranean or to Europe. If you, if, if you have read, uh, read some of the literature around migration, from Senegal Gamb Gambia route, you would read also about how so many fisher folk are abandoning the trade and, and leaving for Europe because, well, they say there's no longer enough fish in the ocean and there's no employment opportunities and this is the only thing they can do. If you're familiar with the United Delta area, you also see the link between the privation and the degradation of the ocean environment in that part of the world and milit militancy and insecurity that unfortunately now is extending to other parts of the world. And so this is the impact of, of you know, something that you could say is just about fish. 
have gone beyond being about fish to actually being something that unfortunately threatens the very security of the people, the security of the state, and the security of Western Central African region. And this is why I feel it's very important for us to think about this, especially in the context of trying to understand the impact of climate change, trying to understand who is speaking when we're talking about mitigation, what language are they speaking? And then are they actually walking the talk when it comes to implementing those languages or those promises that are um, being spoken? And, and in the context of gift, this is something that we actually have to remember, keep in mind. Otherwise, we we'll end up continuing with this cycle whereby the already vulnerable are paying the price. And so what is the solution to this problem? How can we then move away from all these things we've talked about to um, a successful blue economy? You could say, borrowing um, some of the things that Emmanuel talked about around financing, could blue financing help? Well, potentially it can, because we also see in so many countries, especially um, those in small island developing states, looking to um, debt for nature's nature swaps. For example, last year in 2020, we saw late 2019, early 2020, we saw Seychelles benefiting from the MPA for debt relief scheme. This could potentially be a good thing. And whilst it might be affordable for a country like Seychelles, it, it might not be for so many other countries on the African continent, because you also have to then take into account that you are taking a traditional fishing ground away from fisher folk that are already like squeezed to, to, to the brick in terms of the impact of um, offshore your hydrocarbon, the impact of pollution, the impact of fishing, the impact of expansion of the blue um, economic sector, and now you're introducing this. And so this is why I feel, and this is also supported by evidence of a paper I wrote with my colleague last year, whereby we exploit, uh, um, we explored the blue economic project across the African continent. And we found that for the project that are successful, at least those that we, we deemed as successful, that they were collaborative. They, they, they respected the views and, uh, of the communities that are either going to be affected by the decision they are making or, and or they worked with the communities to actually ensure the exploitation or successful exploitation of the resources or the particular decision that is being made around such exploitation. Of course, this can be very expensive and also this can take time, but it's absolutely beta better to do this than to not do it. Um, thank you so much for listening. I, I look forward to, to engaging with you, to answering questions and to learn more from the other presenters. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Oka, for your work. That was such a powerful presentation. Um, and I think raises some really important questions for the context um, and the implementation of uh, a Green Impact Fund for Technology. Our next presenter is Mr. Dennis Cayallo. So Dennis Cayallo is a policy analyst and researcher based in Kenya. His area of policy analysis, research, and publication is primarily on climate action, food security, and agriculture in Africa. He has worked with diverse teams and institutions, including Jesuit Justice and Ecology Network Africa, Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis, and the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Dennis, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Sure, and uh, thanks for the good introduction and I really appreciate uh, the good presentations that we have had so far. And uh, I'll major my presentation around uh, the green economy and uh, the previous presenters uh, majored more on the blue economy. So I'm looking at the green wave and uh, looking at it from localizing green impact technology innovations in uh, developing countries. And uh, from that perspective, I'll share some bit of context into why the green economy, and then get to appreciate the work done uh, by Professor Ponge uh, in terms of the gift paper, and then also appreciate some of the existing funding efforts that we have. Then ask ourselves, what are some of the local innovations that we can actually take up 
so that as we are talking about these funding opportunities that we'll be able also to have localized solutions and localized innovations and then how we can take advantage of accelerators and incubators in the space so having appreciated that um, we get to get to a, we come at a time that uh, we are coming from cop 26 and uh, the goal has been keeping global warming limited to 1.5 degrees celsius and uh, we also target to ensure that we have net zero emissions by 2050 so we are just simply saying that uh, we want to reduce the greenhouse gases and by 2050 we want to ensure that we have handled it completely but this is coming at a time whereby we are emitting so much greenhouse gases approximately 40 billion tons of uh, carbon dioxide annually and uh, we heavily rely on some of these big emitters they are our industries they are our vehicles for our daily livelihoods so how are we going to get there reduce these 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions is it fallacy or is it something doable and uh, the other day during cop 26 we saw the indian uh, prime minister uh, speak uh, some statements that uh, were meant to mean that uh, while we are speaking of net zero emissions, we also have to appreciate some of the emitters are sources of livelihood for the people. And this is the same case in developing countries that we are in in Africa. Therefore, the bigger question is, is this ambitious or there are some things that we can do locally? So having appreciated that is, um, why are we seeking to do this? We need to lower the carbon emissions. And we also need to avert the billions of tons that we have mentioned. Secondly, we need to achieve clean energy. Uh, the previous presentation looked at it from the blue economy. Looking at it from the green economy and clean energy, we need to ensure that people have clean energy because the fossil fuels are the major emitters of this carbon dioxide we are talking about. And then lastly, we also need to create decent jobs. We not only want to ensure that uh, we have lowered greenhouse emissions, but we also want to ensure our people still have livelihoods and good livelihoods at the end of the day. So having said that, we also need to appreciate that uh, the paper that Aidan and Thomas Ponge did, uh, that's Professor Thomas Ponge, on the Green Impact Fund for Technology. Basically what they try and uh, inform us from the paper is that uh, we can actually have an impact fund that is focusing on green technologies. And uh, they propose that uh, the high income countries should actually put resources together to fund this green impact fund. And uh, this is to ensure that uh, inventions or innovations that are around ensuring that we are addressing uh, climate change and we are also having technologies that are reducing greenhouse gas emissions are also affordable to the low income countries. However, they point out two models whereby we can actually have a, an approach whereby the low income countries or middle income countries that are within the gift zone, that's a green impact fund for technology zone, benefit from this fund. That means they are going to get uh, the, these technologies uh, license free, that is royalty free. They are not going to pay for these licenses. Therefore, this means that uh, investors in these countries can actually take up these technologies at low cost or, uh, and ensure that they are also able to spread the same. The other approach that the paper proposes is to ensure that this model, uh, the, uh, this fund is also available to even the developed countries and the high income countries who are actually contributing to the kitty. So what the benefits for this approach is to, it will ensure that uh, there is competition in the market that people are actually competing to, uh, to innovate and also ensure that they are also distributing the innovations to the larger masses. However, if we take the approach whereby we are also benefiting the high income countries in this fund, it will make the, uh, the fund quite expensive to maintain. So it's a trade-off between uh, ensuring there's more competitiveness and effectiveness and also the available resources. So, this means that uh, we also need to also appreciate which of the two models work. And uh, reading from a number of papers that have been published, especially from the UN, uh, we get to appreciate that uh, climate change or global warming is already uh, coded red. This means that it's already a disaster in hand. Therefore, this means that we need resources to intervene, not tomorrow, but now. So in view of all these parameters, what we would consider a uh, most viable at the moment would be the first approach, whereby we are getting to appreciate that the low-income countries need these technologies, 
we are not able to afford them as much as the high income countries can but let us channel the little available resources to support them to ensure that they get these resources at the least cost uh, possible so that's my take from that particular paper uh, that uh, professor ponga and colleague did and therefore what the question that i ask myself is uh, what are the low income countries or the middle income countries green investment needs and potential to invest, uh, to innovate so as much as we have resources or we are talking of mobilizing resources what are our needs and we have the potential to innovate so that's the question that i ask myself and that drives the next part of the conversation so uh, one thing we have to, to further appreciate is that uh, the green innovation fund or green impact fund is not something new it's something that has already been in existence for the last couple of years and uh, with the recently concluded cop 26 uh, uh, we have heard from different funding institutions and countries uh, institutions like the global innovation fund has already committed and even launched an innovation fund targeting the low income countries and then we have also seen countries like britain allocate resources for what we are calling an adaptation fund and the beneficiaries of this fund are actually low income countries then we have the the likes of uk further allocating resources even to asia they are calling it the climate action for a resilient asia so we see these are efforts that are already in place in terms of mobilizing funds uh, for for green impact then we also get to appreciate there's also another fund that uh, 12 donor governments and of course these are high income countries which have committed for low and develop, uh, developing countries. They have committed uh, close to 413 million US dollars. And then lastly, we also have to appreciate this an institution called Trudeau's Investment Management, already committed 29 million US dollars. So these are resources that are available to support uh, uh, low developing countries and even the middle income countries. Putting together all these resources, we are talking of close to 20 billion a year in terms of US dollars, but uh, the needs of developing countries are actually close to 70 billion US dollars a year. And another thing that we get to appreciate from all this is that only about a quarter goes uh, to boost resilience. And then we also get to appreciate that not much of the resources go to innovation. Most of it is more around resilience. This means we are trying to ensure that the people are able to uh, adapt to the existing conditions be it uh, providing food, be it ensuring that uh, they are able to even adopt small, small technologies available for them. So how much we need to ensure that we also promote innovation and what kind of innovations can we take up as developing countries? And in this case, I use case examples from Africa. So let us not make green impact fund and the green impact technologies simply buzzwords that are already resonating in the space of COP26 and even in our current conference, that we are also going to ensure that we are taking the right steps, <clears throat> sorry, to ensure that we achieve all this. So the big question is what works and is it sustainable? It's time to see climate change as an opportunity for developing countries. Uh, gone are the times when we looked at it from the perspective of developing countries are always at need and it's a liability in terms of climate change, but it's an opportunity to invest by the developing countries themselves and even by the, develop, by the developing countries to ensure that we put resources in what works within our context. So some of the proposed solutions that I focus on is on renewable energy. This is because uh, major contributors of uh, greenhouse gases are actually industries, vehicles, uh, the, the energy, the, the fossil fuel in terms of uh, diesel and petrol that we use. So if we are to reduce the greenhouse gases and also contribute to employment creation, then one major way is actually focusing on renewable energy. And on this screen, I put uh, an image. Uh, it's called the uh, M Copper Solar. It's uh, developed by a company based in Kenya. And uh, that's a small package that includes a solar panel, a, a radio, and uh, some solar powered torches that are uh, paid for by low income uh, households. They can actually buy it at a very affordable cost and ensure that they are able to get light. And at the same time, they are also able to get uh, the technology, for example, radio to listen to, to news and what is happening around the world. So this means that we already have local solutions developed by local farms. 
Then another context uh, in terms of what works and what doesn't work and what is happening around the innovation space of developing countries is uh, the, the solar space in agriculture. In this particular image, it's a solar powered uh, uh, irrigation system that is actually being used by a smallholder farmer in, in a farm in Africa. And we, what we see there is uh, this solar panel, it goes for around uh, uh, $100. Uh, so it, that's around, uh, that's an affordable cost that most of these farmers actually buy it uh, in installments. So they are paying for it from uh, in small, small installments. So this is something that can actually be scaled up within the context. Another thing is around solar dryers. For example, we are talking of uh, climates that have changed and uh, the weather is relatively humid most of the time, especially in the high production zones. So if we are to ensure that uh, we are also not only providing technologies that are beneficial to the seller, but are also beneficial, beneficial to the consumer from the aspect of increasing their returns, then solar dryers can actually be a way to go. And uh, this will not only address the issue of post-harvest losses, for example, if it's maize, if it's vegetables, but will also ensure that we have higher yields. Then another aspect is uh, uh, pay-as-you-go solar coolers. We are talking of uh, things like milk and fish and linking it up with the previous presentation. We get to appreciate that fish is a source of food and it's also a social source of livelihood. So how can we preserve some of these perishable commodities? Some of the aspects is solar powered coolers, which are already in the market, but they are not large scale because it costs a lot of resources to put together such a plant. And that is where the climate impact fund comes in. Then another thing is uh, even around uh, innovations in electric vehicles. We have seen countries like Rwanda, for example, they have come up with the electric motorcycles. They are already in the market and our company is already doing the same. So these are kind of the technologies that we need the impact fund, for example, to scale up because some of these companies are startups and they need resources. Then lastly, we have national grids. Most of the national grids are powered by hydroelectric power, that is water. But we can actually take advantage of uh, uh, these clean energy sources like solar and wind. And uh, a case example is uh, a 50 megawatt solar power farm in uh, Garissa, Kenya. And that image, shows that this is a whole deserted area that is uh, technically semi-arid. But uh, one of the a Chinese firm invested in this in collaboration with the government of Kenya and is able to generate 50 megawatts of solar. And it's one of the biggest in the region. So you can imagine how much we can generate if we had such firms invest in such large investments within our developing countries. So those are some, just some of the highlights of, especially around clean energy in terms of where we can invest. And if we get these resources in these funds, what should we be looking out for? From big investments like this mega solar power plant, or even to small investments like even solar water pumps, uh, solar lighting and the like, and even uh, big investments like even the electric motorcycles, because motorcycles in Africa actually constitute more than half of the means of transport. So it's actually an essential uh, commodity within the region. Then that appreciated, we can't achieve this without accelerators and incubators. And when we say accelerators and incubators, we mean uh, investors who are seeking to look at some of these startups who are innovating and ensuring that they give them the right skill sets, they link them with the right investors, and they also link them with markets so that they are able to scale up whatever they are innovating. And there is a study done by the Aspen uh, Institute uh, by uh, Aspen Network for Development Entrepreneurs that says uh, only 2% of climate technology incubators and accelerators around the world are actually focused on climate technology. So this tells us that, that around 98% of in incubators and accelerators are focused on other things that are not climate technology. Maybe some are even focused on things to do with medicine, it's good. Others are focused on even other technologies. But with climate technology, only 2%. This shows the kind of gap that we have. And most of these incubators and accelerators are actually uh, in developed countries. And only few of them are within the developing countries. Then another thing we get to appreciate from existing research is uh, by the International Finance Corporation that uh, states that uh, around uh, the climate businesses can actually generate close to 23 trillion US dollars in investment opportunities and create 
cumulatively 213 million jobs and achieve 4 billion tons of carbon emissions reduction. So if we are to put resources, especially around climate businesses, accelerating some of these incubations, uh, uh, some of these ideas through our incubators, these are, this is the kind of impact that we are looking forward to get. Therefore, this calls for the need to contextualize our solutions and contextualize our innovations because some of the things that work in the developed economy do not necessarily work in our countries, or even if they have to work, they are not what the people really need, especially to ensure that we are not pushing people out of jobs and we are also creating jobs. Therefore, we need to accelerate such innovations. And uh, looking at this image here, this is the kind of motorcycle that is electric powered and within the Rwandan market space manufactured by Ampersad. And looking at that motorcycle, it's very similar even in looks with the, the, the petrol powered ones. So this is quite, quite an innovation. Imagine if we could scale up such motorcycles and provide them uh, in larger capacity within the African space, for example. And of course, this comes at a cost because we'll need charging hubs because this motorcycle needs to be charged. And how can we charge it? Then we look at now the large investors of uh, uh, solar grids or even wind powered grids to provide what the solar charging ports for such motorcycles. So this is quite an innovation that we can actually look forward to, uh, to scale up, especially within our countries. So how can we achieve this? Uh, we need to provide these centers to incubate. And uh, we have an, a case example, uh, the African Youth Climate Innovation Incubation Hub. We have the likes of Chandaria Innovation Center in, in Kenya. Then we also need to provide the seed capital to ensure this works. And this is from the impact funds. Then we also need to ensure that uh, we also appreciate what we are losing because we lose some taxes. For example, fuel uh, in these countries is heavily taxed. So that means we lose taxes, but looking at it from another perspective is we'll benefit from uh, locally produced power sources. And then we'll also lower our fuel importation costs because we lose taxes, yes, but we won't be importing the fuel. So we lower our costs from that perspective. And then we create local jobs because look at the people will be able to benefit from this, from farmers with their technologies to even the transport industry among others. Then lastly, uh, one thing we have to emphasize is that, uh, and this I picked from the gift paper, that we need to ensure that when we are innovating, we are also encouraging adoption. We are not just putting together technologies that people are not taking up. And then we also need to ensure that uh, the local industries and the local uh, business people are actually diffusing or are spreading out these technologies. Some are, it should even be imitating some of these technologies because they could actually make them better. And then we also need to ensure that we collaborate to ensure some of these technologies work better. And uh, yesterday I was uh, reading a paper whereby uh, Subaru, is one of the manufacturers of Yeko and Toyota, had collaborated to, to manufacture totally uh, an 100% uh, uh, vehicle that's powered by electricity. So such kind of collaborations are good, even competitors collaborating to come up with better products. So this is the kind of things that we should actually encourage in our developing countries. Then while concluding uh, my presentation, one thing we have to appreciate is uh, there is no plan B. The plan is only one, to ensure that we lower greenhouse gases and we create decent jobs. So how do we uh, uh, ensure this? As part of my takeaways is that we need to boost uh, global scale clean technologies and we also need to upscale local innovations. So we are not only trying to import technologies, but we should also boost what is available locally, what our people are innovating. Another thing we need to ensure is that uh, we need to attract investors because if we don't create the right business environment for investors, they will always run away, be it uh, around ensuring that the tax schemes are also friendly to investors. And this will create jobs from suppliers of the equipment to distributors of the equipment and even service providers because if we have some of these technologies, it will require service providers. And then lastly, we also need to elevate the voice of climate research and innovation in Africa. Because if we don't get to appreciate what is happening in our space, if we don't get to appreciate and uh, put out the word, there are some of the innovations we have and some of the big investments that we have, then we'll not be able to yield the right policy solutions. We'll 
always report what is recommended to us by the developed countries, but not pick what works within our context. So we also need to ensure that we elevate the voice of climate research and innovation within our space. Then climate and environmental action is not one man's business. It's not the business of the developed countries. It's not the business of COP26. It's our business as everybody. We need to bring our minds together. We need to appreciate the entrepreneurs that we have. We need to appreciate investors. We need to appreciate incubators, financiers, academics, journalists and policymakers. So we need all this broad spectrum of people to put their minds together. If it's the researchers, bring their research. The policymakers put the place, the right policy environment. The financiers bring the resources. Then our innovators and incubators give us the products we need. Then at the end of the day, we are going to consume something that has the brains of each and everyone within the space. So those are the kind of uh, things that probably would work and uh, are already working within our space and uh, would appreciate even as the Global Impact Fund uh, putting resources to scale up such innovations. So I think I'll stop at that point and uh, get to appreciate the organizers of the conference for the opportunity and also look forward to comments and reactions from our audience. Back to you, uh, moderator. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Kayala. Um, Great to have you with us and thank you for that presentation. Um, so I think uh, I'm, I feel like I benefited and learned a lot from all three of those presentations. So thank you to all of our presenters today. Just to highlight some common themes. Um, first of all, it sounds like uh, the core mechanisms of a green impact fund for technology um, basically uh, I heard from, from all of you that, that these are great and helpful and promising mechanisms, but we also need to pay attention to some particular aspects of the context in Africa and globally. Um, so just to highlight some of the common points uh, that we cannot talk about climate mitigation in Africa without also considering um, the food and climate nexus. So the importance of food systems, including land-based agriculture, as well as capture fisheries. Um, for all kinds of intersections uh, in both of those types of food systems. Um, the importance of the general economic context. So some things that were mentioned and some things that weren't uh, include sovereign debt, illicit financial flows, um, gap, the gap between mitigation and adaptation. We know that there's a lot more funding for mitigation and there's a lot of urgent need for adaptation funding in African countries right now. Um, and also, of course, the wider context of food and human security, um, which, as Dr. Okafor Yarwood highlighted, is being actively undermined by current investments and financial flows from the global north. So these are all important things to think about. Um, at this time, I'd love to take uh, questions from the audience or if the panelists have questions for each other or Professor Poga, if you'd like to weigh, weigh in on any of this. Um, if you'd like to speak, feel free to uh, simply unmute and do so. So I can ask a question. Um, so uh, I think one thing that uh, both uh, Dr. Nyadze and Mr. Kaelo highlighted was the uh, innovation already happening in Africa. So um, I think my question is, what is the, the role of a Green Impact Fund for Technology? Does it presume that innovation is going to happen in countries in the global north that have kind of this monopoly on intellectual property rights? Um, or is it something that uh, people, uh, innovators in Africa, especially African firms, but also young people, as Dr. Nyazi highlighted, um, would be able to benefit from as well? So we hope that it's going to be uh, the latter to a very large extent, right? So the way in which it currently works is that innovation requires capital and capital is heavily concentrated in the global north. So unsurprisingly, the global north has a tremendous advantage in terms of innovation. So when it comes to new lasers or new artificial intelligence or space travel or whatever it is, who has the billions of dollars required to be doing cutting edge progress? Well, it's the north. 
The North is then patenting these innovations. And if the South wants to participate in them, they have to pay uh, the gatekeeper in order to even be allowed to participate. Now, what we obviously want is we don't only want cheaper access by the global South to the innovations of the North, but we want to build capacity. We want the global South to be a major innovator. So how can we achieve that? And we think the Green Impact Fund can make a big contribution to that as follows. There are some innovations that are particularly needed by poor people. And those innovations under the current system simply don't get developed, right? A, a new drug for a disease that uh, virtually only poor people have, who wants to bother developing such a drug, such a pharmaceutical, such a vaccine, because there's no money to be made by it because poor people can't pay these large markups. Uh, the electric uh, motorcycle was a great example of a technology, right? You could say that is a technology that's uh, borderline is sort of more for poorer people, uh, really rich people are not going to be driving around on a motorcycle, they're going to have their big stretched limo or something. But there, you could easily imagine lots and lots of green innovations also that would be especially relevant for poor people, for example, a, a fuel efficient wood stove that keeps indoor pollution to a minimum would be extremely useful for poor people, whereas rich people, of course, uh, have uh, are connected to the electricity grid and can just turn on the switch. So point is that there are there's a big class of innovations that are mainly useful or needed by poor people. And with the Green Impact Fund, these kinds of innovations that are highly useful, but don't have a big market under conventional rules, those innovations would suddenly become targets of investment because suddenly you could make money by developing such innovations. Now, who would be best positioned to do cutting edge research in those areas? Well, it would be people uh, in developing countries who have the need right on their doorstep in front of their eyes and who would be highly motivated, maybe even with government support, to work on exactly those innovations that are urgently needed by the poorer halves of their populations. Uh, that in turn would develop research capacity in poorer countries and would then allow poorer countries to develop a system, a capacity for doing innovation for doing research that would ultimately hopefully make them competitive uh, across the board and not just with regard to technologies and innovations that are mostly needed by the poor. Great, thank you. Uh, would any of the panelists like to respond to that? Yeah, so I think uh, Professor actually has mentioned the essence of the gift and all of us our presentation directly goes to tap the fact that uh, there's great level of potential with this gift and more particularly to help African countries and uh, more poorer people to be able to develop their own innovations which otherwise wouldn't have been possible because of lack of funding and uh, from the perspective of um, an African, for example, or, or somebody who is interested in such a fund that come to Africa, my issue is not about the fund itself, but how the fund is being mobilized is okay, but how the fund will be utilized is what we should be looking at more particularly. Now, the problems of African countries more, they have called more for adaptation, more than the mitigation projects. So my idea is that uh, whilst we are thinking about mobilizing funds to help African um, tech, green technology, I mean, most green technologies are targeting more mitigation practices, but for this to really go and, um, and be more beneficial, we should also um, open the scope for which uh, the funding can target. That technologies that also leverage also some adaptation that can help people adapt to the change because uh, the demand for money for adaptation in Africa is, uh, or in developing countries, for example, is very huge, but only just like I said, 20.5% or just few percentage of the amount of money goes to developing countries for adaptation also. 
So we should look at it uh, in terms of how can we leverage these tech green technologies in a way that um, we encourage people more to come up with innovations and technology that deals that has dual benefits. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that has dual benefits. And such technology should be given more priority, or perhaps uh, people should be encouraged to come out with such technologies. Yeah. Can I quickly comment on that one? Yeah, uh, yeah. Basically, what I want to say, but I mean, I, I totally agree with the point, but uh, I want to say something about a characteristic of impact funds, right? Impact funds, in order to work, they require a uniform metric of value. Uh, social benefits are di diverse, they're heterogeneous, different kinds of social benefits. And if they are uh, diverse and different, we need a different impact fund. We need a green impact fund uh, for uh, mitigation. We need a uh, health impact fund for pharmaceuticals. And uh, on the one hand, what's great about impact funds is that they can achieve a wide competition. You don't just have malaria drugs competing against malaria drugs, but you can have pharmaceuticals across the whole spectrum of pharmaceutical innovations all competing against one another for the social benefit of achieving health impact. The same with the Green Impact Fund. But of course, this has its limits, right? With the Green Impact Fund, it's emissions. We are trying to get emissions reductions, and that's the common metric that allows us to compare and to uh, reward on a single scale a wide variety of different green innovations. But now when it comes to adaptation, we need to think of a different fund. We need to think of a different scale of value of social benefit and say, here we create a new space in which many different innovators that all are trying to achieve the same goal of uh, climate adaptation uh, can compete for achieving value. So this would not be something that we should uh, put into the same fund, mm. but it's something for which we should create, I think its own fund and think about it. We haven't thought about it, but uh, what, what we have thought about so far is mainly pharmaceuticals, the pharmaceutical sector, the green technology sector, the agriculture sector, where you could look at nutrient yield, for example, any kind of innovation that increases nutrient yield and maybe reduces the need for pesticides and fertilizers. And uh, we've also thought about education where skills and employment would be the main metric that you would use across a wide range of educational services that might be provided. But I totally agree with you and uh, that the impact fund idea has the potential to be applied in other sectors as well in any kind of sector where innovation is important and where uh, the ability and willingness of people to pay for innovations is not a good measure of the value of an innovation where we can't rely on the ordinary market forces to tell us uh, how much reward an innovation should achieve. So I actually know that uh, the, the, the gift is actually at its infancy, if I may say that way, and the discussion paper perhaps could not uh, go a long way to talk about the issue of how these, uh, uh, the metrics, as you mentioned it, uh, mm -hmm. are going to, which kind of metrics are we going to look at in terms of uh, um, which innovation receives funding, and what, how do we actually mobilize and estimate how much contribution people have made like I was talking about, the climate finance already have a lot of problems in terms of uh, these agreed methodologies in measuring how much or what is actually a contribution. Mm -hmm. So it's not like um, a company or a private sector or a public sector contribution to a country in terms of aid will be factored in as uh, part of uh, a contribution to this funding or something like that, but it should be clear. So I think going forward, it's important that we come out with clear cut uh, metrics as we have already mentioned. Mm -hmm. to be able to, and these metrics need to be as transparent as possible. And um, in a way that uh, the people, I mean, the continent benefit from the technology itself, because most of these green technology are coming from the North, the global North, and most of those are in the South are not competitive enough. So if we really want to establish the fund, my, 
my 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 what I think about now is the funding going to focus on only African based technologies which are growing up. Of course, I know that those um, at the global north who already have technologies but are protected by property intellectual property rights are also going to be handled in a way that they can be given easy access by those at the south. But I hope it doesn't become a way of only supporting the already established technologies at the global mouth for people to assess, but also beefing up the capacity of the local technologies with the funding so they can also um, improve upon the, the technologies that are at the grassroots so that they can be more competitive in terms of innovation and not necessarily only supporting um, the global of technology and making sure the property rights are reduced a bit or are made flexible for the South people to use. Other than that, it becomes the North produces and the South uses, and that can be a problem in itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Totally. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nazi. I think we're out of time, Professor Poga. Do we have time to give closing comments to the yeah, other can, two panelists, or do we? We can go okay. a little over. There's no problem. We have nothing Great. else. This is the end of the day for us. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks. And let's uh, let's hear some closing comments then from Dr. Okafor Yarwood, and then we'll go to Mr. Kayalo. But thank you so much, um, Emmanuel, first of all, for the question you've asked and the point that you've raised. And also, thank you so much, Thomas, for your response to it. Actually, I have a question for you. You know, we recognize, okay, perhaps we need to have uh, an adaptation fund. The question then is who is going to fund it? Because will the global not be willing? I mean, we've already seen how things are working. They seem, everyone seems to be quite individualistic in trying to solve this problem for themselves and for their people. And if we're not getting enough in terms of the mitigation fund and the contribution and the pledges that's been made, who is going to fund the adaptation fund? Should we decide that maybe this is something that is going to happen? And how are we then going to ensure that they work the talk in terms of making the contribution? Because the reality is, as Emmanuel pointed out, and at least this is talking from the ocean perspective, adaptation is as urgent as yesterday. The reality is that there's not enough fish anymore. And this is why we're seeing increasingly criminality in coastal communities because they're trying to find ways to make ends meet. So how do we fund this adaptation fund? Should we think that this is the right direction to go? Thank you. Yeah, should I answer directly? Right, it's, it's okay, yeah. Sure, so yeah, please. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the, the thing is your uh, presentation was deeply moving, you know? I mean, we are eating your food. That's basically what we're doing. We are, we are paying 10% of the cost and uh, then taking the fish and eating it and leaving Africans with insufficient food, with protein deficiencies. And it, I mean, it's just heartbreaking. So who is gonna pay for it? Of course, if you ask me, I would say we should pay for it. The, the West, Europe should pay for it. The United States should pay for it. We are creating this climate disaster. We have created, we have transmitted the pandemic to Africa, which has led to enormous disruption in the uh, economies of African states. So we owe you big time, uh, not even to speak about colonialism and all the rest of it. So, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's gonna happen, right? The, what I think, uh, thinking and uh, putting myself into your shoes and looking at it from an African perspective, what I think is the most important thing is a certain amount of African unity as much as you can muster. If, if Africa can speak with one voice, it is a morally powerful voice that is very difficult to ignore. So, and that is something that Africa so far hasn't achieved. I mean, not at least uh, enough to get the African Union uh, a seat at the table in uh, the G20, in uh, the OECD negotiations about the new tax regime and so on. Africa speaking with one voice would be very difficult to ignore. And Africa also being a strong unit in a Southern front together with India and uh, some Latin American countries saying, speaking with a united voice and saying, you just can't do this. You know, you, you can't treat us this way in terms of our fisheries. You can't treat us this way in terms of green innovations and so on. 
So, and of course, the, the North is pursuing a strategy of divide and conquer, right? If uh, you don't give us your fish at a favorable rate, we go to some other African country and get the fish from there and they will sell us. So, uh, and similarly with treaties and so on, you have to really work together and uh, bring your full political power, small as it may be, to bear in international negotiations. That uh, is, I think, key. And then, of course, the other thing is you need to have really good ideas that you can put forward that are very difficult to sideline or to dismiss. And I think the impact fund idea is one such idea that you say in this day and age where we are chafing under climate change, it is insane to say to people, if you want to use a green technology, you have to pay a monopoly markup. If you want to use dirty old technology, you can just use it. It's off patent. You know, go ahead. If you want to use green technology, something that is good for the environment, you have to pay the North money because we have got the patent on this. So we are going to Africa. We are asking you guys to help us clean up the mess that we've made with our emissions. And then we are saying, by the way, if you want to clean up this mess, want to help us clean up this mess, you have to pay us for the privilege because we've got the patent on this one. So it's absurd, but it's something that uh, you know, reflects the reality as your lecture in a different context brought out very powerfully. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Dennis, would you like to uh, offer some? Sure, sure. Th thank you, Brian, and thank you, Professor Poj and uh, the co-presenters. So mine is uh, not rather a question, but something to add to the thoughts that uh, Professor Poj has said. In terms of uh, as developing countries, we also need to come up with uh, innovations that I need innovative enough to attract these global funds. But uh, one thing I would uh, rather emphasize would be the issue of uh, striking a balance between getting innovations that lower greenhouse gases and also getting innovations that do not push our people to poverty. Because our people live hand to mouth. Most of them, they need money. So bringing up good innovations, for example, an electric car, for example, you may, if I may use that as an example, that's not the very basic need of somebody who needs food on the table. If that person will probably need a technology that will enable them to produce food from their farms. So as we are thinking around these innovations, let's think around innovations that strike a balance between creating local jobs and also being affordable to the local people. Then the other thing would also be an, uh, able to also showcase some of these innovations. Uh, what we get to see from the public media and the print media and the very good reports that we get to see are innovations developed from, from the West. But locally, <clears throat> sorry, locally we still have some of these innovations. They might be small scale, yes, that need outscaling. So let us have platforms that showcase some of these small, small innovations that could actually attract these impact fund resources to outscale. They might not be at par with what the, the West is producing but we could actually uh, use in incubation centers and acceleration centers to actually uh, spur these ideas to even uh, levels that we could actually even sell to the West because we don't have to always be consumers of uh, technologies mm -hmm. developed from the West, but we could actually, with their support, of course, with, because the resources, some of these resources coming from them, scale up what we are producing, sell to them, and considering that uh, some of our countries have low labor costs, it means that even producing them locally will actually be cheaper than producing them in the West. Another last approach could actually be some of these big innovators in the West could actually put their farms in our developing countries. One thing they will do is they will create jobs for our people. Another thing is they'll ensure that diffusion is easy because uh, we are not exactly importing it, but we are actually producing it locally using their technology. So that is one thing, uh, a few things that I would add to the discussion around how to ensure that our impact fund really works and works for the better of our people and not to the detriment and benefit of a few people who are actually funding it. Thank you. Yeah. 
Super. So uh, may I comment on that briefly? So uh, the, the big switch of the impact fund approach is that we measure the value of an innovation, not by the market demand for it, how much money people are willing and able to bid to use that innovation, but by the needs that it satisfies. So if you provide a pharmaceutical to a poor person who may have no money at all, that has exactly the same value under the health impact fund proposal as providing a medicine to a rich person. And similarly, if you reduce pollution that might be created by a poor person, uh, that has exactly the same value as reducing uh, pollution by a similar amount uh, that is caused by a rich person. So we are replacing uh, the willingness and ability to pay with need fulfillment as the standard. Now that will uh, go a long way towards meeting the objectives that you have, namely the three dimensions of the problem are innovation, manufacture and consumption, right? So uh, I talked already about innovation, how innovators in the global South, in Africa in particular, would have a better chance to be competitive in particular in creating the kinds of innovations that are locally useful and locally needed. Manufacturing, you spoke about the labor cost advantage. So a lot of that manufacturing of uh, these innovations that are useful for poor people who are suddenly becoming a big market, right? Because need is now what counts. So suddenly where Africa was a very small market uh, before under the present system, with the gift and the health impact fund, Africa would be a huge market because there would be a lot of need to be met in Africa. So again, manufacturing would be much more efficiently done in Africa rather than in the global North. And then of course, the third class would be the consumers who would benefit because they would be able to buy innovative products and services without any markup. The monopoly markup that is protected by patents would disappear. And so people would be able to afford it. And very often the innovator would even try to subsidize the product, right? If I get paid as innovator, if I get paid for the use that people make, the more people use my innovation, the more emissions are taken out of the atmosphere or not even go into the atmosphere and the more money I make. So if very poor people cannot afford my gadget, then I will often say, well, look, I give it to you even cheaper than my production cost because I then get the additional reward that comes from reducing emissions by even more. So the whole mindset of innovators will be completely reversed, right? Currently, they scour the universe and say, is anybody using my innovation without paying me? Is there anybody at all? You know, and my lawyers will come after you and we will make sure that we shut you down as quickly as we can. The opposite would happen with the impact fund, right? The innovator would go around the world and say, please use my innovation. I help you set it up. I show you how to do it. I give you my know-how. I subsidize it for you. I help you install it in the most efficient way so that it will work really effectively to keep more emissions out of the atmosphere. Because the more good my innovation does, the more money I make, the larger my share of the impact fund. That's the revolutionary idea here, you know, to remove barriers to diffusion and in fact, to grease the wheels of diffusion and try to make it as lucrative as possible to get these innovations out there and to develop them in the first place. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Poga for, for that comment and for, and for having us. Um, I think unless there are any other closing comments or, or urgent words that need to be said, um, I'd like to just say thank you uh, for having us again and thank you to our panelists for such a wonderful discussion. And thank you to you, Brian, for organizing this and sharing it so astutely. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to do thank it. You. You're welcome.